Well, Paul, thank you very much indeed. It's great to uh, be with you today and to have the chance to share some thoughts with you. The title of this session has evolved a little bit since uh, uh, you first in invited me. Uh, the first invitation suggested it should be about uh, a hung parliament, um, uh, Brexit and, and the civil service. And uh, obviously a hung parliament's not an issue anymore. Um, Brexit um, has uh, apparently dropped down the uh, batting order. Uh, it's just the civil service. But I will have a few thoughts on uh, uh, all of those issues. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not a great expert in uh, local government at all, um, although I suspect I was first elected as a councillor looking around this room full of youngsters um, before pretty much all of you. Anyone elected to the, to a, as a councillor before 1978? Yeah? Okay, couple, couple, bit of competition. Uh, but uh, I was first elected to Westminster City Council as a stripling youth of uh, uh, 24 in uh, 1978, which does make me feel really old today. But great to be with you. And, of course, I've got so, quite a lot of background with county councils because I've been an MP in two different places. Uh, first of all, in Warwickshire, North Warwickshire, uh, when I did uh, two terms in Parliament there. I was then liberated by the voters in... 1992. Uh, they thought a, a change in career direction would be good for me uh, at that stage. And then re-elected uh, in West Sussex uh, in uh, 1997, where I served as an MP for 18 years until 2015. So living on a pretty regular uh, basis with, with county councils. And I know you've had some discussions about the unitary movement, and some of that uh, flavor was just coming out in the exchanges uh, just now. <laughs> Uh, and um, I put my cards on the table. These are very familiar uh, discussions, uh, and uh, the argument in favor of unitaries is always uh, efficiency. I, my cards, I don't have a dogmatic, religious, theological view about whether unitaries are better than uh, uh, the two-tier system. I do have a deep skepticism um, about the benefits of structural reorganization. Uh, because unless it's done incredibly carefully, with absolutely iron control uh, over costs, uh, in my experience, too often it ends up with the same people sitting around bigger desks in bigger offices with bigger salaries and it all costing more. So not to say it shouldn't happen. I'm not going to get in, certainly not going to get into a fight on that one in this room. Um, but uh, uh, I think um, I'm going to say a bit more about efficiency uh, later on. For me, it's much more about culture and behavior than it is about structures, more about chemistry than it is about physics and engineering. So a word about Brexit. Uh, I took no part in the uh, debate on the referendum. I have a lot of history going back over the years. I was uh, negotiating nearly 30 years ago the, well, actually 30 years ago, the uh, single market directives as uh, a junior minister in what was then the DTI, I was then Thatcher's Minister for Europe. Uh, as my Eurosceptic friends often remind me, I was one of the signatories of the Maastricht Treaty. Um, I was uh, deputizing for Norman Lamont, who was, said he was very busy that day. Um, <laughs> Francis, he said, um, I'm not going to be able to do it, but this is your chance to put your footprints on the sands of history. <laughs> Thanks, Norman. And uh, so I have a lot of history with all of this. And I took the view in the referendum campaign that both sides were making wildly exaggerated claims, inflated claims. I thought the arguments were pretty finely balanced uh, and uh, that there was certain, some certain short-term downside, economic downside from a vote to leave. And for those who ask where is that downside, the answer is the short term isn't over yet. Uh, and I thought there was some longer term upside, uh, longer-term potential upside opportunity. But I stress the words potential and opportunity, and it is by no means a given that the country will, when it has taken back control, uh, be able to deliver that upside opportunity. Uh, what I think is that the delta between success and failure is widened. You take out more of the, at the moment, the European Union places a ceiling over what this country can achieve, but it also places a floor below which uh, some uh, ill-intentioned um, changes could be made. And so 
uh, taking back control means more ability to screw it up as well as more ability uh, to make it better. So uh, as uh, powers come back from Brussels to uh, the UK, there will be, and already is a discussion about where those powers should be distributed to. And of course, um, I'm a devolutionist. We're all devolutionists these days. Uh, but one of the things I've observed over my many years in frontline politics is that uh, everybody, there's a tendency for everybody to think that the right level to which power should be devolved is the level at which they themselves operate. Um, and uh, we see in uh, Scotland, for example, that the Scottish government, who have been fiercely in favor of uh, uh, devolving the devolution of powers from Westminster and Whitehall to Edinburgh, uh, also think there's a very strong case for the devolving upwards of powers from local government to the Scottish government. So we see the creation of a single police force for the whole of Scotland, a single fire service uh, for the whole of Scotland, removing that uh, layer of, uh, of local responsibility and accountability. But the truth is that we are a pretty weird country. Um, when you compare us with equivalent countries of similar complexity and, and size, we're very centralized, as between central government and local government, uh, which have the, the uh, I think, the malign effect uh, that uh, too much attention by local government, and we hear some of this already in the short time I've been here, is about the relationship with central government. Too much of the focus is around uh, how do we you know eyes focused on Whitehall and Westminster uh, rather than on the communities we serve. And given the way the finances work, um, that's uh, understandable but undesirable. Uh, and it would be more desirable uh, that there would be more direct accountability uh, to uh, the local electors. Uh, and um, so we're very centralized as between national and local government, uh, but we're very we have a very decentralized central government. And, of course, the effect of that uh, is that much more power resides with civil servants uh, because um, it is a very controlling, uh, uh, very controlling uh, phenomenon, a very controlling structure. Um, you suggested, Paul, I should talk a little bit about what we did in central government to cut the costs and... Uh, uh, and uh, the decentralization of central government uh, was a big part of the problem with which we had to grapple. Every government works in a very siloed way, uh, and I observe this in the work I now do with other governments around the world. Few were as siloed uh, and as decentralized as ours was. So what we uh, did in the coalition government between 2010 and 2015, when I was the cabinet minister charged with cutting the costs of government, we faced a, we had the advantage of a serious sovereign debt crisis. We had a budget deficit of some 11% of GDP. Uh, we were running out of money. It was a bigger budget deficit than uh, Ireland or, or Spain or Portugal or, or Italy. Uh, and uh, there are things, the things you can do are pretty limited. You can put up taxes, you can cut programs, you can cut welfare payments, or you can cut the costs of government, the running costs, the operating costs, the overhead uh, of government. And my job was to do that last one because the politics of doing that are a hell of a lot better than any of the others and the effect on the citizens, the overwhelming bulk of our citizens uh, is, uh, is much better. And we'd had three strands to what we did. The first was the straightforward cost cutting. The second was digital, a big movement towards digital government. And the third was open data and transparency. On the first, we uh, saved cumulatively over those five years uh, over 50 billion pounds compared with Labour's last year uh, in 20, uh, 2009 uh, to 10. Uh, and we, uh, on digital, we went from uh, being, I don't want to boast, but the um, most expensive and almost the worst government IT projects in the world, Car Crash Central, uh, to being ranked last year top in the world by the UN for digital government. And on open data uh, and transparency, uh, have, we pushed this very hard indeed, um, tapped into a very rich creative vein of reasons why data should not be released, uh, and, uh, but we made it happen 
Uh, and while there's still a huge distance to go, several international organizations ranked us top in the world for open data and open government. And these three things are very closely linked together. Uh, and they support each other and they reinforce each other. And for those of you who are seeking to reform your organizations, I cannot stress too highly how important the role of transparency is, uh, how it tends to start to create stronger bonds between the uh, public sector organization, the council and the public, uh, how it, uh, it dry, helps to drive efficiency through open benchmarking uh, and, uh, 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 and it enables the public to uh, exercise their accountability in a way which for all of us who've been in politics and in government can be outside the comfort zone, but it makes us operate better and it makes us do things better. So um, our experience was uh, in that period in a coalition. And that was an advantage because we had two of the major parties operating together. The work that we did, and I, again, I can't stress this too highly, had very little party political content. Uh, we kept the Labour Party very closely informed with what we were doing, and they wanted us to succeed with this work because they thought they were going to win the next election, and they wanted to inherit a government machine that was working better than the one they'd worked with previously. We had this unique situation where all three major parties during the coalition government had current or recent experience of being in government, and that was enormously uh, advantageous. I recently, and this might have been what prompted you, Paul, to ask me to speak here today, uh, unburdened myself of a lecture about civil service reform. I was asked to do this lecture by uh, the... Um, uh, by the Speaker of the House of Commons, uh, and I felt it would be churlish uh, not to do it. I argued that the civil service as an organization needs very serious reform. It suffers, I concluded, from institutional complacency. Uh, I was frequently given, usually always given to begin with, any draft article or speech would always start with the British civil service is the best in the world, sometimes the envy of the world until we asked what the evidence was for this. Uh, and the only evidence we could find uh, that was relevant was that there was a World Bank ranking for government effectiveness in which the UK came 16th, um, uh, which was less impressive. And I remember the head of the civil service saying to me, well, I think we need to find a different ranking system, a different index, um, um, which, which uh, focuses more on the things which we know we're very good at. Um, and uh, the result of that was this summer, the Blavatnik School of Government uh, in Oxford uh, came up with a new index uh, for civil service, the quality of civil services, done in conjunction with the Institute for Government, and it says coyly in fine print at the bottom, supported uh, by the UK civil service. Uh, and indeed, the ranking did improve um, because the criteria were very much focused around um, at the Westminster type systems of a permanent politically impartial civil service. But we still only ranked fourth behind the three other countries that have that kind of system, so behind Canada, Australia, uh, and New Zealand. So there is this deep institutional complacency. There's a failure to take hard skills uh, and operational ex expertise and experience Seriously, and I just thought, I concluded there's a class divide in our civil service. And there's a sort of white collar, blue collar divide. And, and the white collar are the mandarins who always get the top jobs. And these are the policy pe people whose speciality is, is policy. Uh, and then there are the 95% of the others who are responsible for making things happen. And they're blue collar, they're below the salt. Uh, they don't get by and large, the top jobs, uh, in the, the permanent secretary, Sir Humphrey jobs. Uh, and that has to change because the balance is all wrong. Uh, because you all know from what you do uh, that any challenge you face, 10% of the challenge at most is working out what to do. 90% of it is working out how the hell are you going to make it happen? How are you going to do it? It's all about implementation and execution. And in our civil service, that is sort of somewhere down there. 
And the people who gather around the important tables and important people in Whitehall are all the people who are doing the 10%, which is the what. And if you look at the schools of government there are around the world, that's what they all focus on as well. It's the policy. It's always about the policy, much less about the implementation and the execution. And that has to change. And I recommended that the way you do it is you say in every department, every ministry, you have a duumvirate leadership. You have a policy, head of policy, and a head of operations uh, in which the financial, commercial, IT, technical uh, capability comes together and is led uh, by that half of the duumvirate. And in the big operational ministries, the permanent secretary is that person. And in the less operational ones, it's the policy person. And then the head of the civil service alternates between the permanent chief executive of the civil service and the cabinet secretary. So again, operational and policy much more in balance than they have been. That's the way you have to uh, change it. If you're going to have any chance of building in the kind of reforms that we drove through uh, in those five years, some of which sadly are beginning to uh, regress. The second aspect, but which is linked, is functional leadership. Now, this is very boring and technocratic, but the cross cutting functions across any complex organization uh, finance, HR, IT, and digital, procurement, property, major projects. Uh, operational management, things boring things like internal audit, which could be incredibly important, um, they have to be led from the center of the organization. Uh, and in any big, complex organization that is really effective, that's where they're led from. And it doesn't mean you try to do it all from the center, but you provide leadership and a critical mass of know-how and technical expertise at the center. And it has to have, that leadership has to have a mandate uh, to stop the wrong things happening and make the right things uh, happen. That mandate is essential. And what we did with property uh, is a very good illustration of this. We put in place in the, on kind of day three of the coalition government being in place, a rule delegated from the Treasury to me that said no part of central government can enter into a lease on any property or buy a property or indeed pass a breakpoint in a lease without me personally signing it off. Uh, and I had a brilliant but small property team at the center of government uh, and we uh, forced uh, different parts of government to co-locate in ways they hadn't done before. They'd all thought that the right thing to do was go off and have their own nice uh, building, which even if it made sense financially for them, made no sense for the taxpayer if there was another building we were already paying for which was under-occupied. And then it also, you get all the inefficiencies from the silos that that uh, builds in. And it really worked. We cramped up in different buildings, we upgraded, we invested in the buildings, we sold buildings we didn't need and vacated others. Uh, and, uh, we, uh, uh, and the co-location was uh, hugely uh, valuable. It cut the cost. We created much higher energies. There were some buildings in the center of Whitehall I used to go through. It was like walking through the Gobi Desert. I mean, arid wastes with a desk. You could see a desk in the far uh, distance. So creating much more busier spaces, much higher energy activity was all valuable, all part of making it all uh, work better with much better collaborative working across uh, between the silos. And, of course, you, many of you will know about the One Public Estate initiative which came out of that activity, where I think the approach was, uh, was, uh, was important. It took the critical mass from what we mandated to happen in central government, but then made that critical mass available to local government on a voluntary basis. We found, for example, that just in Bristol, Central government alone was occupying more than 100 different separate properties, addresses, despite the fact that there had been a single government office uh, of the southwest based uh, in Bristol. There was still every little bit of government had gone and found its own space. So creating the hubs through the one public estate is a huge initiative, is a huge uh, benefit. Uh, but again, cutting across the silos, efficiency, technology working in a way that's much more interoperable and interchangeable, hugely important. Uh, and coming back to structural reorganization, 
that's why I'm skeptical about the unitary movement. Far much more often, the problem isn't structure, it's culture and behavior, and reorganization can just be a distraction. And I always think a lot of the uh, supposed efficiency benefits can come through really good shared services. And we know that that's difficult to make happen because in central government, uh, in 2004, the government had agreed to pursue the Gershon Review, which said you should have shared services. Uh, by the time I really got my head around this in 2012, nothing had happened eight years later until we made it happen because what, you've found this when you tried to do it, shared services with other councils. Uh, what everyone says is, well, I'm really happy for others to share my services, but I'm buggered if I'm letting, if I'm going to use anyone else's. And you have to do it from the center, and you have to insist on conformity with agreed standards. Uh, if you don't do that, it doesn't work. Uh, and, but there are huge savings uh, to be had through this. Um, and standards are absolutely key. Mandatory open standards for digital were key for us moving from, as I say, being car crash central for government IT projects uh, to being top ranked in the world. Uh, we closed down 1,500 different government websites, all of them on different architecture, costing vast amounts of money, conflicting messages to the public, uh, and we created, we replaced them with a single gov.uk, a single web domain with open source code now used by a number of other governments uh, around uh, the world. We started to manage the big suppliers to government in a holistic way. In our just our first nine months, the balance of the first financial year when we were in uh, government after 2010, we saved 800 million pounds from renegotiating contracts with the big suppliers. 87% uh, of our IT spend was with seven multinational suppliers. Uh, and uh, we, first of all, our problem, first challenge when I said I want to renegotiate with the 20 biggest suppliers to government was, well, we don't know who they are. Because although we had 800 people working in procurement at the center of government, they didn't have the data. And I remember the first meeting, I gathered together some of the commercial directors from around Whitehall. We were trying to draw out the list, and my guy at the center said, well, this particular company, we think we do 60 million a year with them. And one of the commercial directors said, well, I know that's not right. My department does 80 million with them. Uh, so eventually I wrote to the chief executives of the companies we guessed were the 20 biggest to say, at the moment, we don't know how much business we do with you, but the time will come when we do. And I'm, invite I'm inviting you to give me full visibility, full transparency. When the return came in from that company, it wasn't, one, it wasn't 60 million or 80 million, it was 1.6 billion, which made it a much better conversation uh, when they came in, because I then brought in all of them, one by one, for meetings with us where I said, at the moment you think you've got 27 different customers around government, from now on you've got one customer, it's Her Majesty's government, uh, and for your purposes, that's me. Uh, and uh, out of that process, just in that first nine months, we saved 800 million pounds. And the truth is that uh, the way this was being done, and I've seen this in so many other governments as well, far too much uh, spend was concentrated in the big, supposedly safe suppliers. Um, these seven multinational IT suppliers objected strongly when a select committee uh, described them uh, as uh, an oligopoly. Um, I mean, they might say that I couldn't possibly uh, comment. It was almost as if the way we were doing procurement in those days, it was almost as if SMEs were being deliberately frozen out, deliberately uh, excluded. There were endlessly long pre-qualification questionnaires, you know, 80 pages for a 50,000 uh, pound contract just for the pre-qualification uh, process. Um, performance bonds, turnover thresholds, um, uh, the three years audited accounts uh, required, so any newish business, a lot of the most innovative, dynamic businesses just excluded from the, the get-go. It meant a lack of competitive tension uh, and a lack of opportunity. And this was the, both of these things really important, but the lack of opportunity for smaller, newer, dynamic, locally-based UK businesses to be able to compete for and win government and public sector business. So huge opportunities there. A word about open data 
uh, and transparency. And I, again, I can't stress too much how important this was. Um, and it was, gets, gets you both as, a, as an official, an officer, but as a politician, it gets you out of the comfort zone. Because uh, my experience was that, uh, and I find this uh, wherever I go now, uh, all oppositions are very much in favor of transparency. And then they get elected, and for the first 12 months, they continue to be in favor of it because all they're uh, releasing all is, uh, and exposing is what their predecessors have done. But then after 12 months, you're exposing what you yourself have done, and you're doing it in real time. And that can be uncomfortable. It's out of the comfort zone. But my God, it makes you do things better. Releasing uh, the detailed financial information um, and, you know, my colleagues used to say, but Francis, all we're doing is um, giving ammunition to our opponents and to the media. Uh, but actually what you're doing is building trust. I always remember when some of you will recall we had a big issue with two big suppliers to government being found to be overcharging us. And I did a review. I had a review done of, our, of all of their contracts across the whole of central government. And what it found was that the quality of contract management across government was pretty weak uh, and exposing the taxpayer and the exchequer to risk. Uh, and the draft of the report came up, and I regret to say that some civil servants wanted to water it down because it was quite brisk in, in what it said, and we insisted that it should be published, um, uh, warts and all. And I always remember when the BBC reporter came in to interview me about it, and I, he, was what, he was reading the press release and the executive summary, and I could see his face falling. And at the end of it, he said in a very disappointed uh, tone of voice, he said, well, Francis, no one's going to accuse you of a whitewash. Um, and the lesson I drew from that is that what, what creates ammunition is when bad news is dragged out of us. When you volunteer it, it becomes routine. Uh, and, you know, we published the rankings, the traffic light rankings for our major projects. We set in place a major projects authority, uh, so independent, uh, no more ministries marking their own homework, independent, a judgment of how a project's going. Uh, and, uh, and it became, yes, a bit of few stories about uh, big projects which were red ranked, but after a bit people come to say, well, actually, if they're telling us the truth about things that are going wrong, then maybe they're also telling us the truth about things which are, are going well. It's part of this rebuilding trust, which is we often talk about, but we don't often talk about the things we can actually do day by day uh, to make that better. So uh, open data, with the arguments against it, as I say, tapped into a rich vein of creativity. National security was always a good reason. Uh, privacy, you can always unsettle a politician by saying there's a risk to privacy by publishing the data. Uh, legal reasons, often ill-defined, and when you probe and use the, um, uh, the most frequently heard words in my office, which were, show me the chapter and verse, often these objections uh, uh, melted away. Commercial confidentiality was always a strong runner. Uh, and at the end of it, they would say, well, Minister, uh, the, quality, the quality of the data isn't very good at the moment, so we need time to uh, clean it up and make it better, to which my answer was, publish it, and you'll find it pretty soon gets better. Uh, and, uh, 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 and so it did. Finally, just to say finally, um, none of this has party political content. There's no ideology here. Uh, this is all about government working better so that whatever politicians of whatever color and background want to do can get done effectively, efficiently, uh, and in a, in a timely way. Now that I have uh, retreated from frontline politics and government, and have discovered at my advanced age my inner lurking entrepreneur. Uh, I now work with other governments around the world who want to go down the same path of reform. But I don't need to go abroad uh, to do that. And if any of you running big, complicated uh, councils want a bit of help doing some of this stuff, I'm open for business. Thank you. <laughs> Now, we haven't yet got the red light, so there are time for maybe one or two questions. First hands, one at the back there, Martin. Second one, anywhere? Because I know that the red light will come on very shortly. And we need to move on to the next session. But, Martin, over to you. Thank you very much.
you very much. Fascinating <coughs> presentation. And as someone who got elected to Hillingdon Council in 1978 as a, a first-year child, I, I share your joy, by the way. <laughs> um, I was fascinated by your comment about stripping out layers of local government, actually leading to increased costs and increased bureaucracy in your experience. Um, I'm just fascinated because is that based on evidence? And if there is, maybe you could just share maybe a couple of examples with us. Um, and also, if it's worked so successfully in Northern Ireland, Wales and Scotland, why isn't it fit for purpose in England? Um, I don't think there is any evidence. It's a, it's a, the, I, I, what I've seen, in the, there is a huge tendency, um, a, a natural process in the public sector for things to merge and get bigger. Uh, and you see this in the health service. You see a repeated process over the decades in the health service of uh, we think this, this entity is too small, so it's got to be merged with another one to get critical mass and make it bigger, whether that's a kind of in the old health authority days, and then they get too big, and they're, so we've got to break them up again. Uh, and there's an endless um, process uh, where it, 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 the, reorg the, the, the process of reorganization become, can become a displacement uh, activity uh, and uh, a massive distraction from doing the work. Um, and uh, it comes from this desire we have in this country always to have a perfect plan for something before embarking on it. I agree that might not appear to be the case with Brexit at the moment, but uh, <laughs> um, uh, there's always an exception. Um, and um, uh, I became an addict um, in, um, uh, when I was in government of what came to be known, well, the, the people who ran G GDS, the Government Digital Service, had a very elegant form, which was the strategy is delivery. Uh, my much blunter version was JFDI. It's the JFDI School of Government. Just do it. Very good. And it, anything which is a distraction is unhelpful. Yeah. I had a rubber well, stamp. With, I had a rubber stamp with JFDI put on it, and it went down <laughs> around, around the corridors of power. It wasn't universally well received by the officers. Um, <laughs> any more questions? One, one quick question from me on, yeah. on, on the one public estate. I mean, the, the principles of it, I think, are great. Unless I'm missing something, uh, we were a one public estate pilot in Kent, mm. and we found that the National Health Service was sitting on assets all over the yeah. place. Could we make them, release them, and uh, put them to, uh, into the pot for community good? No, we couldn't. Yeah. It, it's who's holding the levers to make things happen. And, you know, the buck doesn't stop anywhere. No. Uh, having identified, done a lot of hard work, Am I missing something, or is that...? No, no, you're not missing point. anything, Paul, and you are absolutely right. It was a cr we used to have uh, endless sessions trying to pry surplus real estate out of the hands of different NHS entities, um, and incredibly frustrating because they all felt they didn't, just in case they might need it at some stage. Ministry of Defence, just as bad, mm -hmm. actually, mm -hmm. uh, and most parts of the public sector are pretty bad at this because there's no incentive. There's far too rarely any incentive um, to release it. Um, so, uh, but, but the one public estate was, we were particularly concerned with office space um, because um, you know, most, uh, my, my experience of public sector uh, office space is that it was under-occupied in too many different places, under-invested, so they weren't very, too much of it was not a particularly good working environment. And so if you can, uh, Cramp up, co-locate, um, and uh, and upgrade. You create a much better working environment. Plus, you actually force almost the collaboration. I mean, you physically break down uh, the silo. So the more it can happen, the the better. And those habits of working together, of people from different parts of the public sector, being seeing each other and talking to each other physically. Uh, can be very powerful in terms of driving good behaviours. Right, now we do definitely have the red light on now, so uh, on all our behalf, Francis, thank you enormously for coming along. Give us such a enlightening.